Now this is significant. The man charged in the 1996 shooting death of rap icon Tupac Shakur made his first court appearance today. It's a sight Tupac's family and millions of fans around the world doubted they'd ever see. 27 years after his killing, Dwayne Davis, a man long known to investigators, in court charged with murder. So guess what? The cops have finally slapped charges on a dude linked to Tupac Shakur's murder back in 96. Can you believe that mess? Tupac was just 25, but man, he pulled off more in those years than any of us could dream of. It felt like there was this big conspiracy, you know? Like we'd never get to the bottom of it because so many players were in the game. They were pointing fingers at P. Diddy, blaming Shug Knight, who, by the way, was cruising in the car and got suspected of setting up the whole shooting thing. Why? Because Tupac wanted out of his record label, Death Row, and there was all that drama with Notorious B.I.G. And get this, even the cops were in the mix. Some of them were working off duty for these crime guns linked to Death Row. It's nuts. Nobody seemed trustworthy in this whole crazy scenario. Let's dive into this wild ride and unravel the mystery, shall we? People had pretty much given up hope ages ago that we'd ever figure out what went down with Tupac. His mom spent decades fighting for answers, but she's gone now. And justice is just a word at this point. Better late than never though. At least we've got some answers. Now let's rewind to the night of the murder, September 7th, 96. Mike Tyson was throwing down against Selden in Vegas and you know Tupac and Tyson were tight. Tupac always rolled deep, causing a ruckus wherever he went. This time they spot Orlando Anderson, a crip in the hotel lobby rival gang to Tupac's Bloods crew. Check out the CCTV. Tupac and Anderson had beef before and it's all going down. Shug Knight joins in, giving Anderson a beating. They're strutting out like they own the place. So Tupac and Shug decide to hit up the 662, a mob-owned joint, the mafia vibes and all. Last pick of Tupac and Shug is snapped there. Shug at the wheel, Tupac riding shotgun. Now here's the deal. Tupac pulls up at a stoplight on the Vegas Strip, a white Cadillac rolls up, and bam, shots fired. Tupac takes hits, survives for about a week, but he's never the same. Lungs filled with blood, and the game changes forever. So, peeps weren't really buying the whole Tupac got shot thing, cause, you know, he'd been shot before and shrugged it off like it was nothing. Dude seemed immortal or something. People thought, ah, he'll bounce back. It didn't hit them right away that this was the real deal. Let's take it back to the time when Pac actually got lucky and dodged death coming for him. If you lose your composure, you can do anything. And he, he fear got stronger than love, and niggas did things that they know they weren't supposed to do. They know in their heart. That's why they in hell now. Right. They can't sleep. That's why they telling all of the reporters and all the people, why are they doing this? They fucking up hip hop. Because they in hell. They can't make money. They can't go anywhere. They can't look at themselves because they know prodigal son has returned. I'm alive. The ghost is walking around. On November 29th, 1994, Tupac and his buddy Charles Fuller faced serious charges, sodomy, sexual abuse, and weapons possession. Trouble always seemed to find Shakur, who found himself in numerous scrapes with the law. Shakur's police record included charges of shooting at police, carrying a loaded gun, and assault. And in 1995, a jury found him guilty of sexual abuse. The accusations came from a 19-year-old woman named Ayana Jackson, who claimed Tupac and Fuller messed with her in Tupac's fancy hotel suite on November 18, 1993. Imagine a dollar, 700, 50 a night spot on the 38th floor of the Parker Meridian Hotel. So during the jury's first day of figuring out what's what, Tupac bounces for a Harlem publicity gig and a recording session with Little Sean at Times Square's Quad Recording Studio. Picture this. He's potentially facing 25 years in the slammer, and he knows this recording might be his last for a while. Now, jump to November 30th, 1994. Tupac's in Manhattan, waiting for the verdict, and bam, he's ambushed and shot in the lobby of the Times Square recording studio. His lawyers cry setup. Tupac points fingers at Biggie Smalls, who's upstairs in the studio at the time. Earlier that night, Tupac got an invite from a New York DJ named Ron G to record for free. He agrees being the cool dude he is, and heads to Quad Studios for the session. But here's the twist. He gets a call saying they don't have the cash to pay him. After some back and forth, Tupac's assured he'll get paid by Uptown Entertainment after recording. At 12.16 a.m., Tupac and his crew roll up to Quad Studios. Teenage junior mafia members holler at him from the terrace. 
Tupac thinks it's all good. Upstairs, it's a party. Biggie, Puffy, and more. Quad Studios is buzzing with excitement. As Tupac and his squad approach the studio entrance, they spot three dudes in army fatigues, Brooklyn style. Tupac's like, whatever. They get buzzed in, walk towards the elevator, and bam, ambushed. Three guys, two guns, and Tupac's on the floor, getting robbed. They snag his jewelry, shoot him five times, and beat him up. Tupac loses a testicle from one of the bullets. The robbers swipe $35,000 worth of Tupac's gold, and Freddie Moore, Tupac's manager, loses $5,000 in jewelry. The chaos continues, and Tupac's dragged into the elevator, heading upstairs for first aid. Tupac's shocked. Nobody upstairs seems phased by the madness. Tupac's bleeding out, but he's Tupac. He makes a call, lights a joint, and dials 911. Cops show up, and Tupac recognizes some familiar faces from past encounters. In a typical Tupac move, he flips off the photographers as they wheel him out on a stretcher. At Bellevue Hospital, they patch him up. Dr. Leon Pachter says Tupac's lucky the bullets weren't bigger or he'd be dead. Against doctor's advice, Tupac checks himself out at 6.45 p.m., and his mom wheels him past reporters. The next day, Tupac shocks everyone by showing up in court. Wheelchair and all, he's got that charmed Rolex still on, gauze on his left wrist, and a Yankees hat covering his bandaged head. Tupac's a living legend, even after a wild night like that. Not too long after the NY shooting, Pac found himself in trouble on the other coast. Orlando Anderson, the main suspect, got jumped by Tupac's crew, but not long after he got off, just like many others in those street wars. But here's the kicker, one guy from the car didn't get whacked, and now, a couple of decades later, he's on YouTube spilling the beans and pretty much pointing fingers at himself. Say hello to Kefi D. You said the shots came from the back. Big Dre, Orlando, who shot Tupac? They keep it for the cold of the streets. It just came from the back seat, bro. So Kefi D spills the beans in these YouTube interviews talking about the 662 club scene. Tupac and Shug were a no-show, so Orlando and his crew were out hunting for them. Now, Kefi D is trying to play it cool, saying, oh, it came from the back seat. I was just in the passenger seat. Classic move, right? He's basically trying to ride the wave of being involved without fully admitting to it. But let's be real, he's been yapping about this for years in interviews. Reminds me of what Chris Rock said, slap a demo tape on someone and the cops won't care. In Kefi D's case, it's like, I feel bad for Tupac, but attacking Orlando was fair game. The whole thing's been a wild ride and this dude's been talking like it's an everyday story. Life, huh? It's been a solid 27 years since Tupac got hit up in that Vegas drive-by, you feel me? The cops snagged Dwayne Davis, AKA Keefy D, a Southside Compton Crips dude who's been fronting like he witnessed the whole deal, got nabbed on September 29th. They slapped him with a murder charge, talking about using a deadly weapon and the judge was like, no bail, bro. So back in July, the cops rolled up on Keefy D's spot, looking for all sorts of tech gear. Word is, a grand jury had been digging into the proof for months. Keefy D's been spilling a lot about that night, even dropped some details in a 2019 memoir called Compton Street Legend. Oh, and here's a kicker. He's Orlando Baby Lane Anderson's uncle, the dude they thought pulled the trigger back in 96. Anderson got smoked in 98, but stayed claiming he didn't off Tupac. Keefy D spilled the tea in 2018 about being in that Cadillac. And now he's the Lone Ranger from that ride. He spilled to the cops in 2010, threw it in his memoir, talking about it was to dodge a drug ring rap. Tupac's murder's been buzzing for ages with all kinds of wild theories, like it's tied to Biggie's death six months later. Greg Kading, this retired LAPD detective on the case, says it was a headache to crack until Keefy D started yapping. Now he's saying Keefy D planted himself right smack in the middle of this whole conspiracy. So who's Keefy D and how'd he get mixed up in the biggest LA police saga? That's a gang tale worth spinning if we ever heard one. Keefy D, born on June 14, 1963, had some deep connections with the Southside Compton Crips, and his life story is like a crazy mix of gang life, personal losses, and a solid stint behind bars. Growing up in a massive family with six brothers and six sisters, Keefy D's childhood was steeped in that gang lifestyle. Sadly, his mom passed away from colon cancer in 1980 when he was just 15. Here's a twist. In his 2018 memoir, Keefy D dropped the bomb that, in 2014, 
he battled the same cancer that claimed his mom. Insane, right? But whether by luck or not, he's in remission now. If he catches a charge, though, he might end up doing time. Cancer is no laughing matter. Apart from losing his mom, Keefe D faced some heavy family tragedies. Two of his brothers met tragic ends, one from cancer and the other was shot in Compton. Losing his older brother to a street shooting threw a major curveball in his journey. Life got real rough, and he found himself deep in the world of crime, spending more than a decade behind bars, dealing with all sorts of criminal chaos. He even unloaded two clips into a rival gang member's place. Talk about intense conflicts. His criminal journey began back in the 71 when he jumped into the Crips scene due to, you know, peer pressure and all that. Later, he tried to make some legit cash at Compton College, but it wasn't rolling in fast enough. So he turned to the drug game, and surprise, surprise, it paid off, at least in terms of cash. The law caught up with him, though, and he did time from 85 to 89, but here's the kicker. Instead of rehabbing, prison just turned him into a tougher gangster. Once out, Keefe D dove into the hip-hop scene, rubbing shoulders with Easy e and former drug kingpin Harry O. Harry O was big in the Death Row Records scene, the label that launched Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, and Tupac. Speaking of Tupac, Keefe D spilled the beans about him too. Wild enough, he had ties to Harry O, who got his sentence cut short by Trump in 2021 after being behind bars since the 88. But that's not the end of the tale. Keefe D was tight with another Death Row co-founder, Shug Knight, but things got messy. They were buddies since their childhood, playing Pop Warner football together. Keefe D was the running back, and Shug played center. But when Keefe D teamed up with P. Diddy, things took a turn. Diddy borrowed a low rider for a music video, messed it up, but at least he coughed up the cash for repairs. That kicked off a friendship, even though Death Row and Bad Boy Records, founded by Diddy, were going head to head. I think, you know, you run your mouth, you, 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 talk, <laughs> you talk yourself into a search warrant. Uh, maybe, maybe you've even talked yourself into a murder charge, you know, we don't know that yet. So, for a good 25 years, Chris Carroll, the cop who found Pac, first in that car in Vegas, has been wrongly thrown into the mix by fans. Some say he was in on the murder. Others think he helped Tupac pull a disappearing act to some foreign land. It's crazy, man. Either I was part of the murder, or I hid him, or I moved him to another country. All ridiculous stuff. But when people start yapping, the story takes on a life of its own. At one point, it got so nuts that I had to hit up my homicide buddies and be like, hey, should I be worried here? And of course, they just laughed it off. Nothing to it. Even though the cops have named Keefe in the search warrant, Carol knows the conspiracy theorists won't budge. I'm telling you, it won't change a thing. The folks who think he's still alive will keep saying he's still alive. This won't shake many of their beliefs. I've talked to so many of these people, and no matter what proof you throw at them, they won't buy it. Carol's seen it all and says, I'm not easily surprised anymore because it just keeps coming. Now, I didn't expect something this big, but it looks like this case isn't fading away. There's always something going on. So here we are with a major development, and things are going to be buzzing for a while. As far back as 96, Vegas detectives, LAPD, and the FBI were stuck. No conviction because witnesses, including Shug Knight and Tupac's cousin, weren't spilling. Keefe finally spilled the beans, but Carol's not betting on a prosecution. Personally, I'd be shocked if they go after him. I doubt it'll happen. Time will tell. It would surprise me. Families want closure. And while there's a ton of evidence out there, we pretty much know who did it. Orlando. And he's dead. Keefe might talk a big game, confessing in his memoir and all, but Carol's not convinced. I don't think there's gonna be much from this. It's 26 years later, most players are gone, and there's not much physical evidence. If a gun turns up though, that could change things. The bullets from Tupac's body could be matched up, and that'd be the big break. SWAT teams hit Keefe's crib recently, but whether they found a gun or not, Carol isn't sure. The video showed a whole SWAT show, but the most significant evidence we could find is the firearm. If they got that, it's game changer. But I'm hearing no gun so far. Carroll goes way back to the Tupac incident in 96. He was the first officer on the scene after Tupac's BMW got blasted on Las Vegas Boulevard. So I, I, I finally, the door popped open, but what had happened was, it, as it turns out, it's Tupac inside. Well, he's leaning against the door. 
So when I when I pulled open the door, he kind of fell out with the door, kind of slumped out with the door as I opened it. So I had I grabbed him with my left hand and kind of took him down to the pavement. I got a gun in my right hand and Suge Knight still running up my back and I'm still pointing a gun at him, you know, saying, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this guy, if, if he jumps on my back, uh, I'm in trouble. The rapper took some last breaths in Carol's presence before succumbing to the gunshot wounds. The past two decades have seen Carol deal with crazy theories and wild accusations. But this recent Keefe D twist, that's a whole new level. So word on the street is that Keefe D spilled the beans, claiming the shooting went down as payback and to cash in on a cool million bucks that Sean Puffy Combs, AKA P Diddy, supposedly offered for offing Tupac and Shug Knight. Surprisingly, P Diddy's still walking free, dodging interviews about these accusations. Now that this guy's in cuffs, P. Diddy's probably sweating bullets, especially considering Tupac's hit track, Hit Him Up, where he took shots at both P. Diddy and Biggie. Tupac already pointed fingers at P. Diddy for the first shooting he survived, so it's not looking good. Some folks thought Shug Knight might be behind it, but that sounds sketchy, considering he was in the same car and took a bullet to the head. This theory linking P. Diddy to Keefe D makes more sense, given their history. Eminem even hinted at this in a recent diss track aimed at Machine Gun Kelly, who signed to P. Diddy. Eminem suggested that P. Diddy greenlit the hit that took out Tupac. Now, whether Eminem was joking or serious is up for debate, but he sure stirred the pot. All signs seem to point to P. Diddy being the culprit in Tupac's murder. Funny how things unfold after all these years. P. Diddy, if found guilty, could be looking at prison time, which is a massive fall from grace for a guy who's enjoyed decades of success. Eminem even mentioned this in his song, but whether he was just playing or serious, who knows? It's quite the bombshell, considering the long-standing mystery surrounding Tupac's death. Now, with this arrest, some loose ends seem to be tying up. Let me know your thoughts in the comments because honestly, everyone involved in this mess is either dead or in jail. Look at Shug Knight. He's behind bars, a shadow of his former self. Retribution might be off the table and it could just be jail for Keefe D. However, if they bring down P. Diddy, a billionaire, that would be a game changer. Lately, he's been giving back publishing rights, acting all charitable. Quite the twist in the saga, but there's a reason why that is happening. Diddy is in a lot of trouble, even if we disregard the Pac situation. He got slapped with multiple allegations for all kinds of wrongdoings. As you probably know already, Diddy has been hit several lawsuits, accusing him of abuse. He's been fighting Diageo for more than a minute, and to top it all off, the companies with which he's been collabing over the years, they want out. 18 of them for now, to be precise. So here's the latest scoop. Another woman known as Jane Doe just dropped a bombshell accusing Sean Diddy Combs, along with Harve Pierre, former president of his record label, and an unnamed person of sexual assault. This lawsuit claims the assault went down in 2003 when she was just 17, and Diddy was 34. Jane Doe alleges that they targeted her as part of a sex trafficking scheme involving drugs, alcohol, and a private jet trip to NYC, where she was allegedly gang raped by these three individuals at Diddy's studio. The lawsuit filed under the Victims of Gender Motivated Violence Protection Law provides her until March 1st, 2025, to file civil claims. Diddy, Harve Pierre, Daddy's House Recordings, and Bad Boy Entertainment are all in the hot seat as defendants. Jane Doe's lawyer, Douglas Wigdor, who previously represented Cassie in her lawsuit against Diddy, stated that these abhorrent acts have scarred his client for life. Cassie and two other women, Liza Gardner and Joey Dickerson Neal, filed lawsuits last month accusing Diddy of sexual abuse. Jane Doe claims that Cassie and the others inspired her to share her story. Diddy, not one to stay silent, has vehemently denied any wrongdoing, stating, enough is enough. He claims these allegations are attempts to tarnish his character and legacy. In this new lawsuit, Jane Doe alleges that she met Harve Pierre in 2003 at a Detroit lounge, leading to a horrifying series of events, including forced oral sex and a private jet trip to Diddy's studio. The suit even includes photos taken in Diddy's studio on the night of the alleged assaults. While representatives for Diddy had no comment on the photos, they could potentially be significant evidence. 
Harve Pierre dismisses these claims as a tale of fiction, vehemently denying any involvement. The lawsuit paints a disturbing picture of a vulnerable teenager coerced into a horrifying situation. Jane Doe alleges she was drugged, raped, and left emotionally scarred by the experience. This case is part of a larger wave, with multiple women accusing Diddy of sexual abuse. As the legal battle unfolds, it's clear that the allegations are taking a toll on Diddy's reputation. The question remains, will justice be served, or will this become another case settled behind closed doors? We delved into the Tupac murder saga, Keefe D's revelations, and the spicy theories pointing fingers at P. Diddy. And just when you thought it couldn't get crazier, here comes a fresh lawsuit dropping like a bomb on Diddy's doorstep. Now we're smack in the middle of this legal showdown where people are throwing serious accusations at Diddy, his ex-label president, Harve Pierre, and a mystery person. We're talking alleged SA gang R the whole nine yards, and it's a messy tale dating back to 2003. This lawsuit, filed under the Victims of Gender Motivated Violence Protection Law, is like a Netflix series plot unfolding before our eyes. Diddy's firing back, shouting, enough is enough, and claiming it's all a plot to tarnish his rep. On the other side, Cassie and other brave victims are fighting for justice. We've got private jets, crack cocaine, and jaw-dropping details making waves in the entertainment scene. The saga ain't over, and we'll be right here to spill the tea on the latest. Until then, brace yourselves. The entertainment world always keeps us guessing, and don't forget to keep it Rizzle all the way.